Imagine, if you will, a podcast. A podcast beyond that which is known to man. It exists in both fandom and discovery, in viewing and critiquing. My name is Matt Hurt. This is Anthology. And welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast exploring science fiction anthology storytelling during television's first golden age, beginning with The Twilight Zone. Each week, I share my thoughts on an episode of this iconic series as a first-time viewer, as well as share some trivia about the episode and about the cast and crew. I then end each podcast with a bonus review of a movie or show related to this week's episode. You can find more of Anthology at AnthologyPod.com, and if you want to contact me, you can use the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod, tweet me at ObsessiveViewer, send an email to Matt at ObsessiveViewer.com, or call and leave me a voicemail at 317-762-6099. If you like what you hear and want to help support the podcast, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews I get, the easier it will be for people to find the show in iTunes' search results. Today on the podcast, I'll be discussing The Last Flight. It's the 18th episode of The Twilight Zone's first season, and it aired on February 5th, 1960 on CBS. I'll also be sharing my thoughts on this 1961 aviation sci-fi adventure film, Master of the World, based on novels uh, by Jules Verne and adapted by Richard Matheson. But first, I have some general housekeeping to do. First of all, I was recently a guest on Submitted for Your Approval discussing the Twilight Zone episode Execution with host Brandon Cruz. You can find a link to that episode in the show notes, and I encourage you to go check out uh, both Submitted for Your Approval as well as Brandon's other podcast, Apathetic Enthusiasm. And second of Lee, or second of all, or secondly, whatever, um, my obsessive viewer co-host and I spent the a couple weekends ago uh, here in Indianapolis at Indie PopCon, uh, where I debuted and distributed my new anthology business cards, which I was really excited about. So if you're one of the people I pitched the show to, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy it. On a related note, at Indie PopCon, I spoke to my friend Brandon from Billy and Brandon Watch Movies and Synap Shot Productions, who are a big part of Obsessive Viewers Yearly Shocktober and Irvington event here in Indianapolis. Tickets to that are actually on sale now. You can find links in the show notes. Anyway, he's a listener and gave me some really good feedback on the podcast and the new format. He also mentioned that he has been meaning to write an email about something that I said in Episode 7 of the podcast, where I reviewed the Twilight Zone episode, What You Need. So, Brandon, if you haven't already, which as of this recording you haven't, uh, consider this a reminder to write that email and I'll talk about it in a future episode. Uh, Finally, I am really excited to announce that I have finally pulled the trigger and bought the Twilight Zone complete series on DVD. So since the podcast's inception, basically, I've had my eye on the complete series Blu-ray collection Um, on Amazon. It's been on my wish list for ever. And I had... um, I planned to buy it like in January, but the price went up like twice what it was when I put it on the wish list. So um, anyway, so I had some money and I was turning um, as of this recording last weekend, I turned 30 and I wanted to do something to commemorate that. And what better way to do that than by spending a lot of money on a DVD or Blu-ray set. So anyway, I went to buy the Blu-ray set, but it was out of out of stock on Amazon. So <clears throat> Instead of waiting for it to become available or buying it somewhere else, I just went ahead and bought the 41-disc 5th Dimension Complete Series Limited Edition DVD set of the Twilight Zone as a birthday gift for myself. Um, As far as I can tell, the set is pretty damn sweet, and it includes a crap ton of special features, commentaries, um, lectures as commentary tracks from uh, Rod Serling. And uh, as well as in, <laughs> as an added bonus, it also has the complete 1980s uh, re- reboot revival or whatever of the show. So I'm really excited about it. I posted pictures of it on the anthology Facebook page and at um, Obsessive Viewer on Instagram. Um, so you can check those 
check the show notes for links to all that as well. By the way, um, just so you guys know, the full show notes and links to this episode of Anthology can be found at anthologypod.com slash 013. And just so you guys know, that goes for all past episodes. It follows that same um, link scheme. So if you want to see the show notes to episode 10, it would be anthologypod.com slash 010. So, um, having said all that and having dispensed all of that, by the way, I apologize for the lack of episodes the past couple of weeks. I, uh, started a new job and then with popcorn and everything, but, uh, this, <laughs> this recording session is the first of three episodes I'm going to be recording tonight. So you guys will have some good content, um, in the weeks to come. And so anyway, having said all that, let's get to the last flight. So let's see, let me read the plot description, a quick plot summary, courtesy of the Twilight Zone Companion by Mark Zikri. While on a World War I flying mission, Decker experiences a fit of cowardice and deserts his best friend, who is surrounded by enemy planes. In his panic, he flies through a strange white cloud and lands at a modern-day American airbase in France. He is immediately taken into custody by a major and led in the office by the base's commanding general. At first, both officers doubt Decker's authenticity, but slowly the Major comes to believe his story. In turn, Decker discovers that the man he left to die survived and went on to become a hero in World War II, and that he is due to inspect the base that very day. Realizing that his trip in time has been for a purpose to give him a second chance, Decker overpowers the Major, escapes to his plane, and takes off, disappearing into the same white cloud. Later that day... Decker's former friend, now a flight marshal in the, a- in the RAF, arrives at the base. From him, we learn that Decker did return and save him at the cost of his own life. All right, so before I get to my actual thoughts on this episode, I'm going to give a quick talent rundown of the actors um, and the director and writer in this episode. This episode stars Kenneth Hay as Flight Lieutenant Decker. This is sadly his only Twilight Zone episode, um, and I'll get to that when I get into the episode. However, um, he's still alive as far as I can tell, and as far as other anthology science fiction shows, he did appear in one episode of a show called Journey to the Unknown, which was a British anthology series about everyday people finding themselves put into unusual circumstances, many of them supernatural in general. That show aired 17 episodes between October 1968 and January 1969, and Mr. Hay uh, appeared in episode 5, titled Do Me a Favor and Kill Me. Um, In it, he played Dirk Brogan. The plot description for that episode sounds actually really interesting. It's, uh, it says... It says, a has-been actor wants his agent to kill him so that his wife will benefit from the insurance money, but soon has a change of heart. So... I don't know, maybe eventually I'll cover Journey to the Unknown. I tried looking online, and it doesn't seem like there's much... Um, there, uh, it doesn't seem like it's available really anywhere, so don't really... Uh, don't hold me to that, but I would like to at some point, because just judging from that one episode description, it sounds like an interesting show. Playing Major Wilson in this episode is Simon Scott. Um, this is also his only episode of The Twilight Zone. He actually appeared as Colonel Hilliard in the... In the uh, pilot now is tomorrow which i talked about and reviewed as my bonus review in episode nine of anthology which again can be found at anthologypod.com slash zero zero nine and he also appeared in battle him in 1957 which was featured on the marquee and where is everybody that's i guess that's somewhat interesting (laughs) Um, it's also worth noting that he served in the Pacific in the U S Navy during, during world war II. and rounding out the cast is Alexander Scorby as general Harper. Um, again, this is, his own, this is his only episode of the twilight zone and he was a very prolific narrator. He narrated the acclaimed documentary victory at sea in 1954 and also did, um, some classical novel audio cassettes such as Ship of Fools and War and Peace that were highly acclaimed due to his narr- narration style. And he was also well known um as the as a voice that read the entire Bible, the entire Bible onto cassette. So that's pretty interesting. Writer for this episode is Richard Matheson who uh let's see. He you know when when watching this episode it made me wonder if 
Richard Matheson had served in the army or in the in the armed forces during World War II because there's something about this episode that feels really personal, which I'll get into the um, when I get into my review. And I looked into it, and yeah, Richard Matheson actually served with the U.S. Army in Europe during World War II, and, and that experience actually formed the basis for his 1960 novel, The Beardless Warriors. And director for this episode is William F. Claxton. This is his first of four Twilight Zone episodes. Next we'll see of him is Season 3, Episode 12, The Jungle. All right, so here are my feelings as a first-time viewer to this episode. And as of this recording, I've actually watched it like four times because I can't really get enough of it. It's an incredible episode. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert for the um, end of the review and everything. But, man, I loved this episode. Um, I'll just start with um, the beginning, really. Um, I really appreciated like the production value of this episode. Like it opens with this really beautiful um, aerial photography in the opening scene. And as Serling goes through his opening narration, he mentions that William Decker is um, lost. He's, he's lost. And as he says that he's lost, the camera does this awesome like spin as soon as, as soon as he says that Decker is lost and the timing is just a perfect entry point into this really spectacular episode. I absolutely loved it. It That technique and that opening sequence of him landing on the Air Force Base was just spectacular. And had I not known, because I believe I saw the, I saw the description um, uh, when, I press, when I press play on Netflix at the time when I first watched it, um, I saw that it was he comes to modern day. But I, I love the reveal of him landing ne- beside a modern day aircraft in that antique World War I um, plane. It was, just, it was just really striking visual point. Uh, to bring us into the episode. It was just fantastic. So as Decker is brought in to speak with uh, General Harper, this scene, the scene between Harper and Wilson and Decker is maybe one of my favorite scenes that I've seen of the Twilight Zone thus far. It's just so spectacular the way that uh, there's so much confusion going on in that scene. And uh, forgive me, but pun intended, everything is up in the air. And it works so well. So Decker talking to Harper and Wilson feels just so genuine. And the surreal nature of the plot makes it so much more intriguing than it would be otherwise. And the absolute phenomenal acting by Kenneth Hay is just amazing. Because he is, he has this theatrical energy to him. And then when he gets into an argument with um, Harper in that scene it's the two play off each other so so perfectly like like alexander scorby meets his energy so perfectly and i absolutely would have loved to see more scenes with the two of them together just because their on-screen chemistry was so so perfect and so strong and it's such a shame that this is the only episode that either of those actors are in in the show because they were just phenomenal in that one scene. And as for the actual content of the scene, it's it's really great. Like I said, I love the confusion. And it's it's amazing because Kenneth Hay sells the confusion that Decker feels really well. And the audience, in turn, feels that confusion so well as well. Um, because... Between the conversation being about a fighter pilot disappearing under the similar circumstances that Decker found himself and um, Decker talking about coming from 1917 and then everyone in the scene knowing who Alexander McKay is and then later Harper assuming that Decker is there to murder McKay, there are so many moving pieces to this episode's first act that it's it's almost overwhelming to the audience. And I think that that's by design. Um because that's what the, that's where the characters are, and it's not until later that we find out that Decker is this kind of coward who is who's coming to terms with what he did to Mackay, and it's it's such a powerful ca- piece of characterization that we don't even get a hint of in the first act. It's just all up in the air, and it's so it's so well constructed by in in that scene in terms of dialogue and plot um, discovery. However, they do mention the French fighter pilot. They na- they mention him by name, and everyone in the scene seems to know 
who the fighter pilot is. Like Wilson um, clarifies when when Decker says the fr- French fighter pilot's name, Wilson says, yeah, he was lost or, or whatever. And Decker was at the um, memorial service. And it's it's a good piece of dialogue. It's a good piece of world building. It's a good piece of just dialogue in general. But I just wish that there was more explained about the fighter pilot. Um, it's a bit of a throwaway line. And it's, I mean, granted, it's not really needed for this episode. And I didn't feel like the episode was missing that much clarification. However, when we are in the midst of this confusing situation which, as I said before, the confusion works spectacularly well and is really great and um, grounded. When you throw out this French fighter pilot, I'm thinking, like part of me is thinking, is he going to, is this French fighter pilot going to come into play later in the episode or, or what? Because the French fighter pilot left under the, or disappeared under the same circumstances Decker found himself in. And then come to find out there's no, there's no callback to it or anything. It's just a dropped piece of information and that kind of threw me off just a little bit but it didn't derail the episode for me at all like i said this was a spectacular episode in its own right but i do wish there was a little bit more there to that character or to that to that piece of backstory really and after that scene we get a a very spectacular scene between wilson and harper And I just love how layered the conversation is between these two characters because both have such a unique viewpoint of this like crazy science fiction situation that they found themselves in. And the audience can, you know, you can kind of tell that Wilson is, isn't really on board with Harper's theory that Decker is here to kill Mackay and Wilson's still trying to work it out where Harper is so so convinced that this is a hoax or this is a um either either a hoax or it's a ploy to get to Mackay to murder him and really at this point the audience can really kind of side with either one of these uh characters viewpoints because other than this being an episode of the twilight zone there's no real evidence that decker isn't there to murder Mackay. and i think that makes for a really strong um second act when we get to it and to talk a little bit about the plot and the the scenario of this entire story overall, I just I really like that there are two modern day characters to play off of Decker's story. So we get the one scene that I mentioned before with um, Decker and Harper going at it, and when they argue, it's I have to reiterate when they argue and they are in each other's faces and they're doing they're, they have so much high energy. It's so spectacular. It's one of my favorite scenes I've seen so far in this entire series. And then we get Wilson talking to Decker about the whole situation. And Wilson is more reasonable and seems to believe him to an extent or slowly comes to believe him and be on his side. And it this gives Kenneth Hay, who is by far the standout performer in this entire episode and, and such a has such a powerhouse presence that it's it's so it's so captivating. But it gives him an opportunity to show an opportunity to show even more of his range and it adds this complexity to the overall narrative and to the character himself because this isn't just some world war one pilot fighting to get back to his time or this isn't some world war pilot who just happens to land in 1959 it's this story becomes about a man coming to terms with his cowardice and then fighting to atone for that sin and and to fix what he did and that that in and of itself is such a powerful story to um, to tell, and it's told spectacularly well. And as far as the actual mechanics of time travel in this episode, I like that there isn't much emphasis on the actual mechanics of time travel and of the implications of Decker's time traveling outside of what the plot necessitates. That's one of my biggest pet peeves about time travel in general like i love time travel as a narrative device but one of my biggest pet peeves is how audiences will really try to dig into the minutia of it of the mechanics of it so basically this story is so great in its brevity in its brevity of its time travel elements so this guy just flies into a cloud uh, flies out and lands on an air force base and then getting back is as simple as flying back through that cloud it's so spectacular spectacularly brief and well constructed and it brings so much to it bring it gives 
it affords the story so much more time to dive into this character's storyline. And it's something that I really appreciated uh, about it. Basically, the way that Decker, in the way that Decker describes his journey by describing the cloud and saying that when he went through it, he couldn't hear his engine and it was like being swallowed by a vacuum. Honestly, that's all we need to know. We didn't need, to an extent, we didn't actually need to even know about this French fighter pilot even. Like, I would actually go so far as to say that it would be, it would have been fine with, um, I would have been fine with that French fighter pilot uh, piece of dialogue just being nixed from the entire script. And that would have been fine. Because all we need, all we need to be brought into the story and to go along for this ride is Decker's description of the cloud and what happened when he went through it. That's really all we need. So going back to later when Decker is speaking to Wilson about his cowardice, um, that is just where this episode comes together just really beautifully. And the actual story being told is comes to light in this scene. And I just, I love how the camera just focuses on Decker going through his monologue. And again, Kenneth Hay is just so fantastic in this scene um, because he's, he's both dispensing this, um, exposition about what really happened when he when he before he came to 1959 while also you can see that he's working through um what happened he's putting together what his purpose for traveling through time is and it's so well constructed at the script level like it's it's absolutely phenomenal and um at first when <laughs> this is this is kind of funny at first when um Wilson tells him that uh, that Mackay had saved a bunch of people during the Blitz in World War II. At first, I thought that the lingering shot of Decker's face as he is putting t- as he is processing this information on my first viewing, I thought that it was just that he couldn't bear the thought of a second World War. Um, and I would have liked that angle as well. If there was more time in this episode, I would have liked um, them to explore that a little bit. But the actual um, thing that's going on in his head just is is much deeper than that, and it taps into the character's shortcomings so well. And I just I love that he's coming to the realization that he's responsible. His responsibility in the story is to get back to Makai to save him, and I I just love that angle so so much. And it's after he realizes that he was sent through time to atone for what happened with Makai that he takes action. And I love that. I love that Decker is willing to do anything to get back. And uh, like, it's, it just shows how wonderfully his character has grown in such a short amount of time. Like I absolutely, I love the line where he says that time has given him a second chance. I, I just, something about that is just such a perfect time travel line. And I just, I I love that. And I mean, this is, this episode encompasses something that I'm, I've been marveling at with the Twilight Zone. It's that Serling and his team, they have such a small window of time to develop stories and characters that are really engaging and interesting. And they have such a small window of time that it's so impressive when everything clicks together so well. It's so impressive that this character can have a full arc that starts with him with him coming to terms with coming to the modern era to coming to 1959 and then ends with him realizing that his cowardice has led him to come back so that he can fly back to save his friend's life. It's, it's such an amazing circle of character development that I just, I I'm amazed at how well it's um, performed on screen and how well it's um, done in this short 24 episode or 24 minute episode. So once Decker escapes and Wilson puts the gun to his head when he gets his plane, um, Decker tells him, and it, like this is such this is such a br- brilliant um, scene because Wilson says he'll he'll fire, and then Decker's reaction to that is, or he tells him he tells him to go ahead and fire because he'd rather be dead, and this this is Decker's redemption. This is his, this is his redemption redemption summed up so beautifully in one line of dialogue and that just I'm just astounded by it. I I absolutely loved it and I was rooting for Decker to get back and save Makai and it's I don't know something about it just something about this episode just really hit me and I I absolutely loved it. Um 
as far as the denouement with Wilson, Harper, and Mackay, um, I think that it's a great button to end the episode on. I, I love the way that the lead bottom nickname um, uh, comes into play. I think it's a really pleasant and succinct way to close the narrative and close out the episode because otherwise without that we would we would be wondering – we would either get this really – drawn out scene where Wilson and Harper are telling Makai about it, or we would have the question of, do they tell them, do they tell him about it? Do they, do they, or do they explain what happened or, or what happened before he got there? But this way it's so succinct and so perfectly done. And it's, it's just great, um, great storytelling in my opinion. Um, as I said, the production value is fantastic. The shots, the aerial shots are beautiful. And other than that, really, most of the scenes in the meat of the episode just happen indoors without much technical fanfare or technical flair. Um, so there isn't really much that I could really talk about as far as the uh, um, technical aspects of the episode. I do like the way that the camera lingers on Decker when he's speaking about his cowardice and also somewhat lingering on Mackay when he's remembering what uh, Decker did for him in, in the end. Like I, I really loved Robert Warwick who played Mackay. I really liked his performance when he was talking about how Decker came back and saved his life as if from nowhere. I, I really liked that um, aspect of the episode. As far as cultural subtext or theme, um, the theme of a character overcoming his cowardice to go back and uh, right a grave wrong and save a great many people, it just provides a really satisfying character arc. I've talked a lot about the the way that the character's story is told, and I think that the the theme itself is broad enough that it will resonate with viewers even today. But I would imagine that back in 1960, there was probably a lot of uh, war vets watching it who could maybe... Um, maybe uh, have this episode resonate with them a little bit more. But I think that the, the theme of the theme of the story is, is pretty broad and um, provides a really satisfying character arc for Decker. And I just really appreciated it for that. Okay. So now I'm going to get into some trivia for this episode. Um, part of the production was filmed on location on at Norton air force base in San Bernardino, California. And just the shots of the planes, in the aircraft and in, in the uh, in the episode is just really beautiful and, and really great. Um, there's a scene where Decker looks out the window and sees a fighter jet kind of taxiing on the runway runway. And it's, it's amazing because we've seen this antique aircraft that he, that he, uh, that he lands. And then we see this and I, at least I could tell just how overwhelming it would be for a world war one pilot to witness this type of, technology um because he's just got this little biplane and then like i imagine like, like those i don't know i've seen footage of like aircraft shooting off of aircraft carriers and it's just it's it's amazing the technology of it is just amazing the speed of it it's really amazing so i can't imagine that a world war one pilot suddenly seeing it um would be overwhelmed by it but um to mention the biplane, uh, the vintage 1918 Newport 28 biplane that was used in um, this episode previously appeared in many World War I movies, apparently. Um, another piece of trivia is that this is the first non-Serling script to go into production. And, you know, I, I've, I've read reviews of it, and, and like in the Twilight Zone Companion, Mark Secree talks about how Richard Matheson has... Um, a tendency to not forsake, but um, he doesn't have the same affinity for the common man that Serling does. And that that's true in this, in this scenario, these are very much not uh, these characters in this episode are very much not um, the everyday characters that you see in a Serling scripted twilight zone episode. But I think that it, it, it got to a really strong um, character point in this episode that I really enjoyed um, as much as I would enjoy a Serling, Serling script. And uh, so this was the first episode of The Twilight Zone scripted by Richard Matheson. And um, previously on The on the Twilight Zone, Rod Sterling had adapted um, the episode and When the Sky Was Open from a short story of Matheson's. So this was the first actual like Richard Matheson scripted episode. And it's funny because Matheson had actually bypassed 
the kind of normal procedure for um, writing an episode, basically. So he, as a first time contributor, it's normal. It was normal in this uh, in the production to write an outline. Um, so instead, Matheson just pitched Serling and uh, producer Buck Houghton the idea of a World War One pilot landing on a modern airbase, and they really just they ran with it and they they approved it. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, the script was originally titled Flight. And the title change to The Last Flight was the only thing that Matheson's script went through during uh, production. It was the only change that happened. And Matheson uh, was quoted as saying, quote, I had double meanings in many of my titles, and I wanted it to refer not only to the flight of the airplane, but to the protagonist's flight from the situation he was in. I suppose it still had a similar meaning. It was the last time he ran away as a coward. So that's an interesting piece of trivia about the episode. And finally, rounding it out, is this episode is uh, similar to a Star Trek uh, The Next Generation episode titled Yesterday's Enterprise. And also, I noticed that it's somewhat similar to a season one episode of the original series, uh, the star of Star Trek, the original series, um, tomorrow is yesterday. Uh, the plot of it is where the enterprise basically, basically finds itself in the airspace of 1960s, um, America and is on the radar. So the entire episode, it, it may not be that similar, but it's vaguely similar, but the episode revolves around, um, the crew of the enterprise, trying to erase their presence from the past so that they don't negatively affect the future. It's it's one of my standout favorite episodes of the original series. And quick plug, you can actually hear me talk about that episode um, as a guest on my friend's podcast, There Are Four Lights. Link to that is in the show notes as well. So as far as closing thoughts on The Last Flight, um, I don't really have much of anything negative to say about this episode. Um I would go so far as to say it's my new favorite episode of the ones that I've seen so far and reviewed for this podcast. And the only issue I have is really the mention of the French fighter pilot disappearing, but that wasn't enough to derail the episode for me. And in the end, I think it's a beautiful episode and it's steeped uh, in a complex sci-fi concept that was um, still really accessible. And Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Hayes performance was just so magnificent that I'm I'm honestly so disappointed that this is the only Twilight Zone episode that we'll see him in. But even still, this was a great, great episode, and I highly recommend it. All right, and before we move on to the uh, bonus review for this episode, here's a highlight from episode 165 of The Obsessive Viewer. It's a weekly movie and TV podcast that I host with my friends Mike and Tiny over at obsessiveviewer.com. I was kind of surprised to, to learn one thing about him, about his life, basically his history with, with relationships. And I mean, this guy, like his story in this is like freaking heartbreaking and just really, really sad to, to say the least. And it just, it really just hit me like a, like a brick. I was uh, very, very taken with this guy's story. And it's not so much... It is his story and everything, but it's also his reaction to certain things, and it is just so, so, so sad. Just so sad. Of course, you can find The Obsessive Viewer on iTunes, Stitcher, and at ObsessiveViewer.com, and find the episode that you just heard a clip from at ObsessiveViewer.com slash OV165. So today's bonus review is of Master of the World. It's a 1961 um, aviation sci-fi adventure movie. Um, it's pretty cheesy and over the top, but it is available in its entirety on YouTube. I'll have the link in the show notes um, of this episode as well. Uh, so basically the plot outline or the quick uh, plot synopsis is that in 1868, an American scientist and his team become hostages of a fanatical pacifist, Rob Rober, who uses his airship Albatross to destroy military targets on Earth. The movie was written by R uh, Richard Matheson uh, and adapted from Jules Verne's novels Master of the World and Rober the Conqueror. Conqueror. So the movie starts with an interesting pre-movie reel um, showing man's history with flight and attempts at flight. It's played for comedic effect and was actually a lot of fun to watch and pretty uh, pretty funny. Um, 
and the movie itself is quick to introduce us to the actual plot. Uh, there's this quiet town in Pennsylvania next to a mountain that some mysterious voice suddenly shouts from. And so, so after that, there's an aircraft that's sent to investigate it. Um, and the aircraft itself is, is really pretty hilarious. It's, it's like a boat but attached to a hot air balloon. So it's like a hot air balloon, but with uh, a boat at the, at the bottom ex- instead of a basket. And on the boat is this coal engine powering it. And it's really hilarious and really funny to see. Um, and after that, once once they get to the mountain and they get into the crater of, it's actually a volcano, um, they get captured and put aboard the albatross and the uh the villain of the movie rober is played by vincent price and he's really quite good he's actually he's actually um really good in this movie um and unfortunately once the plot gets moving um it it you know i was kind of bored by it to be honest throughout the, throughout the whole movie like like i said vincent price is really good in it and also henry hull plays a character by the name of prudent and he's he's really animated and he's fun to watch as well but like his his daughter in the movie it has these two love interests that their whole subplot i i just could not care less about i was not engaged with it at all um, although there is a part where they're captured, the love interests are captured and, um, uh, or, or, uh, they're subjected to this, this really over the top, um, uh, sentence to death, basically, where they, they're suspended from ropes by ropes, um, from the bottom of the albatross. And it's, it's actually really, really thrilling that, that one sequence is really really uh thrilling and really engaging but the rest of the movie just really uh didn't really do much for me and it was i don't know it it didn't do much for me but it was still it was still pretty fun and it was kind of a fun adventure movie um but it was also pretty goofy and cheesy and kind of hard to get into um but i i didn't like i said i didn't care about dorothy and the two men in the movie but vincent price kind of saved the movie for me overall i'm not ragging on the movie itself or i'm not going to say that it's a terrible movie by any stretch but um you might find some interesting things about it or you might you might latch onto it more but for the most part it's a pretty cheesy um cheesy adventure flick from 1961 and again that's available in its entirety on youtube and you can check it out in the show notes So that should just about do it for this week's episode of Anthology. Uh, Join me next week in episode 14 as I discuss The Purple Testament, which is The Twilight Zone's 19th episode from its first season. And the bonus review for that episode will be um, an episode of Suspense titled Nightmare at Ground Zero, uh, which was written by Rod Serling and deals with a guy who is uh, charged with making mannequins for a house that is going to be blown up by a nuclear blast. So look out for that and potentially me discussing an email from Brandon. Actually, that's not going to be the case because I'm recording the next episode here in like 10 minutes. So scratch that. But here in a few weeks, you'll hear um, an email from Brandon on a future episode of Anthology. And also a quick plug, if you are in the Indianapolis area, and you are interested in horror movies and um, local filmmakers and supporting local artists and local organizations, please check out shocktoberinirvington.com. It's a one-night event screening of short horror films from local filmmakers uh, presented by my podcast, The Obsessive Viewer. Um, It's the third year we're doing it. It's a lot of fun. We're going to have giveaways and raffles. Um, We're going to give away DVDs, Blu-rays, gift cards to Irvington businesses, which for those listening, Irvington is an area of Indianapolis just east of downtown. This this little this little community that is really spectacular and really great. And so we're running out the Irving Theater for one night screening short horror films. Come join us. Tickets just went on sale. You can find all the information about it at shocktoberinirvington.com. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode. So thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week for The Purple Testament and Nightmare at Ground Zero. Thanks for listening, guys.
Thank you for listening to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more episodes at AnthologyPod.com, and you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. If you'd like to help support the podcast, please take a few minutes to leave a rating and a review on iTunes. The more reviews I get, the higher the show will be ranked in iTunes search results, making it easier for people to discover it and grow the podcast. Of course, you can always email me your thoughts and feelings about the show to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. You can also tweet me at obsessiveviewer, like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, or you can call and leave me a voicemail at 317 762 6099 for a chance to have it played on the show. If you like what you've heard here, I urge you to check out The Obsessive Viewer, a weekly movie and TV podcast I host with my friends Mike and Tiny. Also check out The Obsessive Viewer blog at obsessiveviewer.com where I write movie reviews, TV reviews, and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. If you want even more obsessive content in your life, subscribe to The Obsessive Viewer subreddit at r slash obsessive viewer and check out obsessivebooknerd.com our sister site for book reviews Views, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out my friend Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com. Once again, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.